Okay. All right. So um, this next talk is called Rejuvenating Rundown Pastures. And I think it, it's a good talk because a lot of people are coming back to a farm either that was in the family or bought a new farm. And that new farm may not have been treated as well as you would have liked. So, so this talk is kind of focusing on what, what do I do when I acquire a piece of land like that. And um, I always like to start out and ask the question is, what, why, do we, why do we lose stands in pastures? And um, there's lots of different reasons, right? Uh, too much or too little water. A lot of times we'll blame a drought for, um, for losing a pasture stand. Uh, poor fertility. A lot of you will encounter that if you bought a new farm. It's, it's been kind of um, leased out for hay and people have been making hay, but when it's not their land, they don't often don't put the resources back in that they need to to maintain soil fertility. Poor grazing management. Maybe that farm was rot not rotationally stocked. Maybe it was a continuously stocked system and it was overstocked for years and years and years. We've got a, a farm near Princeton that I, I've been in Princeton five years now and I've, I've never seen the grass higher than about here. So um, that could be the situation. Poor mowing management if it was a hay field. If we mow too close, uh, especially with orchard grass stands, we tend to lose those stands. Poor choice of forage species. So a lot of times when people move, they, they bring their forage species with them. And while they may have been adapted in Northeast Ohio or Minnesota, they're, they're probably not real well adapted to Western Kentucky. So choosing the right forage species that's adapted to where you're trying to grow it and adapted to the type of soils that you have in your farm is really critical. Um, and then we have weed infestations. And um, a lot of people will, will say the weeds took my pasture over. Weeds are often a symptom of a problem, right? So where's a weed grow in a pasture? where you got an empty space in that pasture is exactly right. So it's a, it's a good Lord like putting a Band-Aid on that, that empty soil in the pasture. So, um, so weeds are often a symptom of other underlying problems rather than the problem themselves. And then we've got insects and disease issues that we can have in pastures too. But, but the point is, is that it's usually more than one factor. And it's, it's not just usually a drought, but it may, it may have been um, poor grazing management, poor fertility management, and then the drought is kind of like the straw that breaks the camel's back. And that's maybe why we lose that stand. So whenever we think about pasture renovation, the first thing that always pops into our mind is that we're going to have to reseed that pasture, right? So uh, get a no-till drill, spray it out, and, and, and reseed it. And really, pasture renovation that's the last step of the whole process. A lot of times we can renovate a pasture without reseeding it. And that's what we're going to talk about is this integrated approach to restoring pasture productivity. And, um, and things that we're going to talk about include things like soil fertility, making sure that we've got the right forage species selection, grazing management, overseeding legumes into existing pastures like uh, Mr. Hall was just talking about, and then um, Reseeding the entire pasture is a very last resort. A lot of times if we do these things above reseeding, we're going to really restore the, that pasture productivity without having to do a complete renovation. So the first one I want to talk about is soil fertility. And I, I can't stress this enough because a lot of the farms that you're going to encounter or that um, you may rent or by are going to be extremely low in soil fertility, especially if the neighbor had been making hay off of it for several years before you bought it. I always like to talk about what a soil is when we talk about soil fertility, and, and we often focus on N, P, and K, so nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in the soil, and those are important, but really a, a soil is a dynamic natural body that's composed of mineral and organic solids, gases, liquids, and living things. We don't talk enough about the living things in the soil. Um, and they, all those things together serve as a media for plant growth. So this was put together by uh, my friend at West Virginia University, Ed Rayburn, and it, it shows living things in the pasture. If we look at below ground, we have about 2,500 pounds per acre in a healthy pasture of, of just plant roots. We have a ton of bacteria. Think about that. 
So a single cell bacteria, and we've got a ton per acre of bacteria in that pasture, in a healthy pasture. And then we've got uh, tenomycetes, which is similar to bacteria. We've got 6,000 pounds of, of fungi in, in a healthy acre of pasture. And then all these other things, protozoa, nematodes, mites, um, and earthworms, 625 pounds of earthworms in a healthy pasture. If we add all those things up below the, the soil surface, we've got about seven tons of living things in the pasture. And that's really important to understand. And when we start to improve grazing management, we're starting to manage these also. So we're not just managing the plant and the animal, but we're managing what's below the soil. And that's really important to keep in, in mind. So when we talk about soil fertility, the first principle that I like to talk about is what we call law, Liebig's Law of the Minimum. And all this says is the level of plant production can be no greater than that allowed by the most limiting of essential plant growth factors. What's that mean? That means what, whatever's the most limiting in that system, and there's lots of different essential plant growth factors, much more than this, if it's soil acidity or if it's phosphorus or potassium or if it's moisture in some cases or temperature, whatever's the most limiting factor is going to hold overall pasture production back. So, so why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because when we talk about soil fertility, we can't pick and choose what nutrients that we want to supply. We've got to have a balanced approach. We have to identify what's limiting in this particular situation. If it's soil acidity, then we need to add lime. If it's potassium because someone's been making hay there and not replacing the potassium that they're taking off the field, then we need to supply that. But we have to have this, this holistic approach um, to uh, supplying fertility in pastures. Now, one of the most beautiful things about a well-managed grazing system is that we have a strong, we can develop very strong nutrient cycles. And what I mean by that is that we have inputs that come into the system so we have nutrients coming in the form of anything that we feed. So hay brings nutrients in, um, any kind of commodity feeds or grain that we feed. Uh, legumes are bringing nitrogen in, in if we have red clover, white clover, or alfalfa, or even lespedezas. Uh, manure, any manure that we bring into the system, or poultry litter, and then fertilizer. Those are inputs into the system, and then they get cycled around within this system. So they go in, go in, the plant takes those nutrients up, the animal eats those nutrients, and then what's the animal do with those nutrients? They're what? That's right, 80%, 80 and 90% of those nutrients, depending on the nutrient, will go back to the soil, right? So that goes in one end of the animal, then it comes out as dung and urine in most cases. So by having good grazing management, we can develop a really strong nutrient cycle in grazing systems. And this is one of the things that really sets grazing systems apart from hay production systems and cropping systems. We're not removing many nutrients from the system. Um, and then exports from this system, of course, would be a calf in the cow-calf situation, or if you're growing stalkers like Mr. Hall, then the stalkers would take some nutrients away. But it's a relatively small amount. So this is from John Laurie at University of Missouri, and he found that a cow-calf pair removes about 10 pounds of nitrogen, 7 pounds of P2O5, and about a pound of K2O. So if I rate this over, say, a stocking rate of, of 2 acres per cow-calf unit, you know, we're removing 5 pounds of nitrogen per acre, 7 pounds of P2O5 in, in a pound of K2O. And we have other losses in the system, too, to leaching and so forth. But... But the point that I want to make is that in the well-managed grazing system, nutrient removal is really pretty low. And um, we can develop a very strong nutrient cycle over time. What can happen in grazing systems is, is we get a redistribution of nutrients over that pasture area. So if I have one large boundary like this, and, and the animals are coming out and they're grazing, and then they come back to where? They come back to shade and water, right? And, and they lay down here, they ruminate, and then they get up to go back out. What happens when they get up? It's like going to the bank, right? They make a deposit usually. And, and over time, we concentrate dung and urine and nutrients around shade and water sources if we don't have a rotationally stocked system. And, and that's really important to understand. We, we've talked about the benefit of rotational stocking in terms of pasture productivity. Um, or plant growth, but one of the other big benefits is we get 
more uniform nutrient distribution in grazing systems. So what do we do about that? Well, we can subdivide these pastures, we can add some water sources, and then we can rotate through these pastures. So if I put animals here, they've got a water source, and I say, well, you're going to graze here, and you're going to distribute those nutrients back in this paddock, and so on as we move through the system. So we're going to get much more uniform nutrient distribution within the grazing system. I, I wanted to mention this because, um, because hay is an import, important part of most grazing systems, whether you buy it or um, or whether you're making it yourself. And it's important to understand that hay contains a significant amount of, of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and other nutrients also. If we look at, say, um, orchard grass, for example, every ton of orchard grass has about 50 pounds of nitrogen in it, about 15 pounds of P2O5, and about 60 pounds of K2O, or potassium. So say I'm making hay and I had a good year and I got a four ton yield. All of a sudden, we multiply these by, by four, so I'm removing um, somewhere around uh, 60 pounds of P2O5, and I'm removing around two, over 200 pounds of K2O per acre. Now, we can do that for a couple of years and not put those fertilizer nutrients back on, but if we don't somehow supply those nutrients back where we're making hay at, or feed that hay back on those same hay fields, um, we're going to draw those nutrient levels down very quickly. I can almost tell you for certain, when I get a soil test and I look at it, I can tell you whether it's a hay field or not, right? Because what would be low in a hay production system? Potassium. Almost always potassium. We hardly ever put enough uh, potassium back when we're making hay off of the field. So it's important to, um, to replace those nutrients. Now, if I'm in a situation where I have a small farm and I'm buying hay, could this be a positive for us? Sure, we're bringing nutrients in, into that system, right? So, so instead of taking nutrients out, if I'm buying hay, I'm, I'm kind of like getting a coupon with that hay, right? So I, I um, get the nutritional value of that hay from my animal, and then I get those nutrients that I'm bringing in in that hay. Now, how valuable those nutrients are is going to depend how, we, how well we get that hay feeding distributed around the farm. So if we assume that uh, one, one ton of hay has 45 pounds of nitrogen, 15 pounds of uh, phosphate, and 55 pounds of K2O per ton, and we assume the, the current cost, of, which is about 90 cents, and then 55 and 63 cents for K2O, these are the, the higher fertilizer prices, Every ton of hay is going to have about $78 worth of nutrients in it. $78. So, so I'm getting a, a $78 value at current fertilizer prices for every ton of hay that I buy into the system. So it's important to remember that. And if you're selling it, it's important to price your hay accordingly to recover the cost of the nutrients plus whatever cost you have associated with making that hay. So the value of those nutrients, again, is going to depend on how we feed that hay within the grazing system. So the, the, um, and we can use that hay to move nutrients from, with, from outside of our hay grazing system into our grazing system, or even to move nutrients around within our farm. So if I, say, had an old dairy farm, where, where are all the nutrients on an old dairy farm? Get close to the barn, right? Because I, I don't like to haul manure a long way. So, so I will constant, tend to concentrate nutrients closer to the milking platform. So if I can have high nutrient concentrations there, I can make hay there and feed that hay on the back of the farm where, where the nutrient levels tend to be lower. I can move nutrients around the system that way. So you always want to feed your hay on your porous paddocks where you need the most fertility. And make sure you move your feeding points around. You don't want to feed all by one gate. You want to move those feeding points around so that you get a more uniform distribution of nutrients in that system. And that's exactly what Greg Halleck is talking about when he talks about bale grazing. You're getting a much more uniform distribution across the, the uh, paddock area. So where do you start at? And the, and the most important place to start at is with a, a good soil test. And, and we want to take a soil test at around four inches. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Soil test is going to quantify phosphorus and potassium, but not nitrogen. Nitrogen is highly mobile in the soil and is very hard to measure accurately. 
it's going to provide us a baseline for developing a, a um, targeted soil fertility program. Otherwise, we're just kind of guessing. Um, and it's going to be even more important when um, pasture, or when fertilizer prices are really high because it's going to allow us to target fertilizer applications. So if I don't need phosphorus on this field, I don't have to put down a 10-10-10. I can just put down potash if I know what my requirements are. And then we want to follow soil fertility every two to three years with samples at least every two to three years in pastures. So real quick on taking soil samples, we want about 20 core, core samples. It's important to remember that the soil test results are only as good as, the field, as your sample is representative of that pasture. So you want to make sure that's representative. We want a minimum of 20 cores. And we want our, our sampling units or our pastures to be 20 acres or smaller. If it's a 40 acre pasture, break it up into two and, and get two soil samples. We want to sample at the proper depth. Our soil test in Kentucky is calibrated for a four inch depth, so that's the depth that we want to sample to. Um, it, and I know this sounds elemental, but elementary, but I was at a field day and I said, well, how, how deep should we be taking a soil sample? I had answers from two inches to 12 inches. So it's important we get that depth right, and that's four, four inches. We want to avoid atypical samples, atypical areas when we're sampling. So those are areas like um, around water, around shade, around where we fed hay at, um, any area that where animals have concentrated at. If we include those in our soil sample, they'll tend to elevate our soil test results um, when they're not really higher. We want to make sure we mix it thoroughly and complete the paperwork so that we get a good recommendation for the crop that we're, uh, we're trying to get the recommendation for. I always like to start out and look at, at the soil pH. The soil pH is, is really important. Soil acidity is a major factor limiting forage production in the southeastern United States. Um, it does two things. It reduces the availability of other nutrients in the soil if our soils are too acid, and it reduces nitrogen fixation in legumes. So liming neutralizes soil acidity and supplies calcium and magnesium. These are some general guidelines. In, in general, we want our, for most grass clover mixtures, like Mr. Hall was talking about, we want to be in that 6 to 6.4 range for soil pH. So this is the impact that soil pH has on um, nutrient availability in the soil. So this is pH here from 4, very acid, to alkaline, 10. And then the width of these different bands, each represents a different nutrient. The wider the band, the more plant available that nutrient is in the soil. So if, if we look at our ideal pH range, which is 6 to 7, that's when all of our macronutrients, things like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, that's when they're all the most plant available. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because if, if you need nitrogen, I mean, you need lime, and um, according to your soil test, then right now it's going to be your best buy. It's going to neutralize soil acidity, and it's going to make everything else in the soil more plant available. So, so don't underestimate lime. If you need it, that's the first nutrient you should go to to adjust. And then we look at um, our lime recommendation here. Our lime recommendations are made based on 100% relative neutralizing value. Um, your, your local agents will adjust those lime requirements for your local quarries because not all quarries have as good of lime quality. So next we look at our different soil test uh, values. and We go from, from low and very low um, all the way up to high. If, if your soil test value for phosphorus and potassium is, is low or very low, then you're almost certainly going to get a yield response to the adding fertilizer. And your recommendation is going to be not for what you just need immediately, but also to help build that soil up over time. If you're in the medium range, um, there's a chance you, that nutrient may be deficient and that you're going to get an economic response to it, but not always. Um, the yield may respond to fertilizer, and you're going to get a maintenance plus a buildup. Now, once you get into the high range, that nutrient's no longer deficient. 
um, and normally you'll get no yield response. So the only thing you will get is a maintenance application. So if you put down on your soil test form that you're making hay, they're gonna say, well, hay's gonna remove so much phosphorus and so much potassium, and we're gonna make a recommendation that you replace that. Now, once you get into the very high range, you'll get no, no recommendations for fertilizer. You're not gonna get a yield response, and you're not gonna get any recommendations because it's going to be more than enough nutrient in the soil to meet the requirements of that crop. And this is kind of what this looks like graphically. So we go from, from very low here to very high here. And this is the yield response, the relative yield response curve. And, and this is the ideal place to be, teetering right between medium plus and high minus. If we're right here, we're, not, we're certainly not limiting yield. In, in reality, if we're in this medium range, we may yield, lose a little bit of yield towards the bottom, but, but not a lot. So if we can maintain our pastures in that, that a solid medium to high minus range, that's the ideal place to be for phosphorus and potassium in our, in our pastures and hay fields. All right, and then we get a recommendation on the bottom of the soil test here. 10 minutes, okay. I'll go on till you stop me. All right, so the next thing I wanna mention is legumes and grazing system. And, and Doc, uh, Bobby Hall's presentation was very good at, at talking about the importance of legumes and grazing systems. That can't be understated. Legumes fix nitrogen from the air with a, a symbiotic dinitrogen fixation is the process. That's the second most important biochemical process on Earth, only second to photosynthesis. So we take that nitrogen from the air, we make it into a plant available form. What, how much nitrogen is in the air that we're breathing right now? What'd you say? Yeah, 78%, wow, you're like the star student. 78%, and that's in the gaseous form, that's not a plant available, so what, what um, legumes do is they form a symbiotic relationship with rhizobium bacteria. In this relationship, the legumes get a place to live on the plant roots in these nodules that are formed on the roots, and they get an energy source from that plant, from sucrose, from the uh, photosynthetic process. In return, in this symbiotic relationship, they take nitrogen from the air, convert it into a, a plant-available nitrogen form, and share it with that plant. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Both are getting something out of it. So legumes are gonna increase yields, uh, they're gonna increase forage quality and animal performance, and um, they're gonna improve summer growth, uh, especially if we include a deep-rooted legume like alfalfa, alfalfa or cerecia lespedeza. Um, and then dilutes the endophyte. We always thought it was just a dilution effect, but as Ray talked about yesterday, the effect of red clover is not just a dilution effect, it's actually a physiological effect. It's causing vasodilation in in the uh, animal, so the, the blood vessels are getting bigger that were constricted from the uh, ergot alkaloids in the tall fescue. So this is kind of the value of, of that nitrogen, and if we, we look at the dollar, which we're closer to a dollar than 50 cents right now, you know, something like alfalfa can fix around $200 of nitrogen per acre per year. So it's a, a, pretty, good, a pretty good buy. When we get into red and white clover, it's gonna be somewhere around 100 to $200 per acre per year. So one important thing to understand about um, nitrogen fixation in pastures is when it fixes that nitrogen, that legume plant, it's not like the legume plant says, here, grass plant, have some nitrogen. It has to be cycled to that, to that grass plant. And the animal's an important part of that cycle. So, the um, sharing is mostly indirect between grass and legume. That means the animal has to eat that legume plant and then deposit that dung and urine on the pasture surface. And when it does that, then the grass can take that, that nitrogen up um, indirectly. Also happens through death and decomposition of plant parts. So when leaves fall on the soil surface and they get broken down by all the microbes in the soil, it releases nitrogen that can be used more complex than that, but releases nitrogen that can be used by the uh, grass plant. So over time, you can develop a very strong nitrogen cycle in pastures, but it doesn't happen overnight. It's, it's gonna take several years to start this nitrogen cycle up um, through good grazing management. Limited direct transfer. 
All right, let's talk just a little bit about managing for legumes and pastures. And Dr. Blazer, who was at Virginia Tech a long time ago, was really one of the pioneers in grazing management, used to say that we should always be managing for legumes in our pastures. Not grasses, but legumes. He says the grasses will come, but you need to focus on legumes and grazing systems. We want them to make up 20 to 30% of the sward. And you know, when we get above 40%, it'll look almost like it's a complete uh, legume stand, but there's really some grasses underneath that clover. Um, we want to lime and fertilize according to soil tests. So our improved legumes like red clover and white clover like a little bit higher soil fertility and alfalfa especially. Um, so we need to make sure that we get our pH right and, and our fertility right, and that creates an environment in, which encourages legumes to grow in our stand. And then we want to overseed in late winter. And I say six to eight pounds. Uh, Mr. Hall was doing 10 pounds of red clover. And then I, I like to put in one to two pounds of white clover with that. Um, and if on, you're on low fertility land, you might consider adding, adding a little bit of annual asphodisa. And this seeding cost is going to be about $30 an acre. So annual lespedeza is a little bit better adapted to, to poor soils. So if you have a rented farm where fertility is not perfect or you're on some shallow soils, uh, annual lespedeza may, may do a, a little bit better there than some of the improved clovers. Yeah, it, it'll graze fine. But if you've got good fertility, good pH, don't bother with the annual lespedeza. Yeah. And then rotational stocking. So, so how, we, how we graze a pasture can impact, you know, our botanical composition in that pasture. So, for example, um, if we have a mixture of uh, clover and grass, if you graze, have a real high grazing height, you're going to tend to favor the, the clover and the grass. I had a good friend in Virginia who was a great grazer, not overstocked, never grazed close, but he had a very difficult time keeping legumes in that pasture because his grazing height was a little bit too high. So if that happens, one way that we can get legumes is we can graze that grass down a little bit further and it will tend to encourage the legumes in that mixture. Use only adapted forage species. I, I know this sounds silly, but I can't tell you how many people try to grow things like perennial ryegrass in Kentucky, and, and it, it's really going to behave more like an annual because it's just not well adapted here. Um, so things to think about when you select forage species is, that, is it regionally adapted where you're trying to grow it at? And then is it locally adapted to the soils that you have on your farm? Alfalfa is adapted to Kentucky, but it may not be adapted to your soils if you have wet nature soils. It just can't handle those wet feet. And then, um, and then is it tolerant to drought and heat stress? It is tolerant to grazing. Um, so, so what are the options? And there are a lot of different options that we can grow, and we talked about some of those this morning in the species talk, so I'm not going to spend any time at this. But it's up to you to kind of figure out what's going to work on your farm and how you're going to fit it into a grazing system to um, give you more grazing days per year. So let's talk just a little bit about grazing management. How am I doing on time, Ray? Five minutes? OK. Talk just a little bit about grazing management. I, I think that's really important. We've kind of been talking about that all along. And, and so this will just be restressing some of those things that we talked about, but it's really about helping these guys make the right decision, right? So rotational grazing is managing two things. It's managing residual leaf area, so how much leaf area we're leaving after grazing. The more leaf area that we leave after grazing is going to, for a grass plant, it's going to stimulate regrowth in that grass plant. If I graze that grass plant right down to the soil surface, it's going to be a much slower recovery. And then the second thing we're managing is carbohydrate reserves. And Ray did a really nice job showing that yesterday. So all, all forage plants have a carbohydrate cycle. So when I graze a forage plant off, regrowth is going to come from energy for regrowth is going to come from two places, leaf area remaining, photosynthesis and leaf area remaining after grazing, and from carbohydrate reserves or energy reserves in that plant. So when we implement rotational stocking, these are the two things that we're really managing. And then we can manage botanical composition. And that's almost another presentation in itself. But how, how we manage grazing can impact what species are dominant within that sward. So just a little bit about implementing rotational stocking. And, and um, you, you've got to want to do it. 
it, don't do it because Ray told you to do it or Jimmy told you to do it or I told you to do it. Do it because you want to do it. And uh, you got to have the right attitude. If you go into it and say, well, this is never going to work, you know, chances of you being successful are pretty slim. I mean, you're going to have problems, guys. You're going to have droughts and floods and, and so on. And but, but if you have the right attitude, you kind of find your way around those roadblocks. Um, in controlled grazing or rotational stocking, water is key. So we talked a lot about that this week or this in this grazing school. So make sure you get the water in a place that's going to allow you to implement rotational stocking. And then we're managing, again, that residual height in that rest period. So that's the, the remaining leaf area in the carbohydrates. Um, the one thing that we don't talk enough about with rotational stocking is the benefit that it has in terms of increased drought tolerance and grazing systems. If you have a well-managed pasture prior to a drought, um, it's going to grow longer into that drought stress and come out faster. I mean, people that switch from continuous to rotational stocking see that. And um, it does that because what we're doing to the top of the plant impacts what's below the soil surface. So if I have a pasture that's grazed down like this tabletop, um, the root system is going to be fairly small, and that's going to make that pasture more susceptible to drought stress. We're going to be able to um, develop stronger nutrient cycles within that grazing system, and then we're going to be able to use rotational stocking to start to manage botanical composition within that pasture. And this last one I think is really important to remember is that, that people often get scared away from rotational stocking because they think they have to move their animals two or three times a day. And, and that's not true. You know, that system has to fit what you, your needs, what you want to do. If you want to rotate animals on Sundays after church, then, then you set your system up so that you make weekly moves. It won't always be a weekly move, but, but it'll be pretty close. So it's got to meet your wants and needs too. The last thing I'll mention is that we, when we design a grazing system, we want to make sure and build flexibility into that system. Flexibility to, to adapt to different weather conditions, flexibility to, um, to uh, expand or intensify our management as we move forward. Great. All right. Can you tell us about that in the field? Okay. All right. All right.